Welcome to episode 260 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak encouragement into the hearts of educators and get you informed and energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm talking with educator Marguerite Randolphs about how she reuses her work via templates in order to save time instead of creating everything for teaching from scratch. Visit truthforteachers.com to get an easy to read, easy to share version of this podcast episode. My number one advice is join. If you are considering it, well, you've probably found this at just the right time in your life. Definitely highly recommend the program. It really helped me to have a successful year. Be more proactive and intentional about how I use my time, how I grade, and also to make connections with other teachers. It gave me back time with my family. I've had more time at home. I've had more time um, to spend with family. It made it really easy. Has allowed me to implement balance in my life. My students and I have a completely different relationship now. I'm excited to be with the kids and they can definitely sense that. What you just heard were teachers talking about the impact of my 40-hour teacher work week. If you want support with this, remember that our Fast Track program is open to new members all year long, along with our 40-hour instructional coaching and 40-hour leadership program for administrators. If you want to learn how to find a sustainable approach to the job that you love, go to 40HTW.com to learn more. My guest today is Marguerite Randolphs, who has taught middle grades, language arts, and social studies for five years. She's currently teaching eighth grade humanities and homeroom at Frontier Charter Academy, which is an online charter school in Oregon. Marguerite is here to talk about how you can save yourself huge amounts of time by reusing your own work. She's developed a plan to create reusable resources that save her between five and 10 hours every single week. One major shift in mindset that she learned was through my 40-hour teacher workweek program, and it's this. We often focus on saving time right now. Considering how we can use our current work to save times for ourselves in the future can be a game changer. Marguerite realized that she can build templates while she's doing her daily work, which saves time and batches the work she'll be doing in the future. Listen as Marguerite shares her process for using three kinds of templates— those for student accommodations, those for instructional materials and activities, and comment banks for student feedback. You can also check out her article at truthforteachers.com to see step-by-step instructions, examples of her templates, and more. Listen in. So, Marguerite, in your article, you identified the most common obstacle to creating templates, which is, as we're working on a task, we think, I could probably use the same wording or format or instructional strategy again in the future, but I have so many things to do right now that I can't think about that. I can't be bothered right now to archive it for later reference. I need to just get this task done as quickly as possible. And that kind of trap in which we're only thinking about our present needs and we're not able to plan ahead often ends up with every task taking longer than it needs to. Can you tell us about your experience with templates and how you learn to build them while you're working on your task? I think I really started very much falling into that trap and thinking, how could I possibly sit down and create a whole new extra thing? Mm -hmm. I have no time for that. And there were a few things this year that really caused me to shift the way I think about templates. And the first one was that I have a set of really amazing colleagues who have really modeled for me the different ways templates can be used and how useful they really can be. And then the second thing that happened is that because I teach online, I started to experience some repetitive strain injuries with my wrists Mm. and very quickly came to a moment where I needed to keep doing my job and needed to start typing a lot less. And so I needed to develop a way to really think about my work differently and still create the same number of things. And that led me to templates. So I think that was the first shift was a matter of necessity. Then the second shift was moving templates from something where I thought I had to create them from scratch to being an organizational problem. 
So realizing that I could create templates while I was already working was huge, that it wasn't an extra thing. It was organize something I'm doing a little bit differently and call it a template. Mm. And so I think I developed this process in my own mind where once I knew I was going to do something again, I copied it and named it a template and then continued drawing on it over and over again. So as you were making a document, then you would save that document and then also save another one called template. And that would be the one you'd return to later? Exactly. And I love Google Docs for this because it's so easy. It's literally make a copy and then rename it template and whatever you have a template of. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk about the three main types of templates that you create. You identified templates for student accommodations, templates for instructional materials and activities, and templates for student feedback comment banks. Tell me first about how templates are saving you time in the area of student accommodations. What's your process there? I think talking about templates for student accommodations can draw people aback a little bit. And that's one of the reasons it's so helpful is that it's not something we think about applying a template to. Mm -hmm. All of our students are unique. All of them deserve individual differentiation. And there are a few shifts in thinking that let you use a template for it anyway. And so I use a template because it helps me batch. I can take care of all of my planning about and communication about accommodations in something like 30 minutes a week. And it makes sure that my interventions are really targeted and appropriate. So I set that up by looking at individual accommodations rather than individual students. So towards the beginning of the year, once things have settled down a little, I make a list of the different accommodations that all of my students have. I teach secondary, so I tend to have a larger number of students than elementary school teachers would have. So sometimes I have eight to 10 accommodations that I'm expecting to communicate about regularly with students. And I make a document called Accommodations Template, and I make a list of those accommodations there. Every week when I go to communicate about or plan about accommodations, I make a new heading that's the name of the week or the date, and then copy and paste that list of accommodations again. Then I'll write a sentence or two explaining, for me in student-friendly language, so I can copy and paste it into an email later, exactly what those accommodations look like that week. So if the accommodation is that students need access to audio resources for reading, it would be something like, please remember that you can use the read-along function in whatever app we're using to read, or here's a link to the audiobook you can check out. And then from that template, I can go and compose individual emails. I send emails as one of my main ways of tracking accommodations and of helping empower students to take control of their own way of using their own accommodations. So I'll send that email to students to make sure they know individually what they're doing for the week. I'll CC parents so they're in the loop. I teach middle school, which is a transitional age for many reasons, (laughs) including parent communication. Mm -hmm. And then I'll send it to case managers or other staff who are involved in the process. And that puts it all in one place. It's trackable and helps me make sure that I'm following up with students regularly about the support they need. I think that's such a great process because it, it, it really reflects that shift in thinking that you mentioned where we have to move from thinking, okay, all my students are individuals and therefore... I have to create everything from scratch to realizing all of my students are individuals and they have their individual needs. And there's a lot of overlap. A lot of them will need the same types of accommodations. And to have this this bank of accommodations that you're drawing from, I think is so smart rather than having to keep um, listing it out over and over. And I think it's also such a great reminder for you about all the different um, accommodations that are available to kids. Exactly. And I'll definitely tweak them for individuals say, reduced workload looks very different for, from one student to another, but reminding myself and having a record of the different accommodations that are available keeps me mindful 
of what I need to be thinking about as I plan. Mm -hmm. How about the templates for instructional materials and class activities? I think this is what we think of first when we think of templates for teachers. And there are a couple of ways I think about these or a couple of shifts I make. And the first shift is that I never make a template the first time I teach an activity or the first time I think, oh yes, I will definitely reuse this. And that's because I don't actually know until I've taught it once. Mm -hmm. I don't know how <laughs> my students will respond. I don't know about the thing that seems perfectly obvious to me and is obvious to no students whatsoever. I don't know those things until I've test driven it once or twice. And so all of the first lessons are first drafts. When I go to teach the same lesson format again, or the same kind of instructions or the same activity again, that's when I think about creating a template. And I end up doing that really simply. I go back, find the first one and make a copy. I'll name that copy template and revise it to make it even better based on what I learned from that first draft. Name it something with template in the title and then make another copy of it. So you have this, your second time creating the activity, you're creating two copies of the first. One is now going to be your template and one is the one that you're using for that second activity. Is that right? Right. So then I can start making changes on that second one for this individual activity and this individual application. But then I can also go back every time I reuse it in the future and have the same basic template or text to draw on. And that really has a few benefits. First is that it saves the clicking and the mundane tasks of repeatedly creating the same name and instructions and background and all the formatting steps. It's so much easier to create a copy of something than it is to remake the same things over and over. Second, it helps students get more familiar with the structures and the processes of activities, which lets them access content more easily. And then third is that it prevents me from being perfectionistic about my work, especially the work that doesn't matter so much. I can revise and I can improve the content. I can revise and I can improve my template, but I don't need to waste time worrying about things like formatting, which is a huge time waster for me. I want to make sure everything looks as nice as possible and that things match well and are formatted cleanly. And sometimes that is not the best use of my time. So I use a lot of slide decks in my instructions. Sometime at the beginning of the school year, I sit down and I make my Google Slides template for the year. All of my slides will look the same. They will all have the same basic font. I know what my agenda slide for the whole year will look like. I might change pictures sometimes. I might add new pictures if I have time. But that's it. And I can tell you that I've had exactly one student notice. Wow. <laughs> that it goes to show you how much effort we spend trying to make things look fresh and new to students. And a lot of times they're just not paying attention. It doesn't matter to them. And I also think you make a really good point when you were talking about that second benefit that you mentioned, which was the familiarity for students allows them to focus on the content. Because every time we're introducing a new activity, a new form, a new set of instructions, students, you know, limited focused attention is going toward trying to understand what to do. But when you're seeing the same template, it's like, okay, I know exactly what this is. I've seen this type of assignment before. I know how to do this. You can immediately focus on whatever the skills practice is or whatever the content learning is rather than, okay, what does the teacher want from me? And I think that's especially valuable at the secondary level or in other situations where kids have multiple teachers throughout the same day, because I, I can't imagine how challenging that must be for our students to have six, seven, eight, nine different teachers who all have different expectations you know, they, they want forms submitted this way. They like this heading on papers. This is when their due dates are. It's a lot to keep track of. And so if your stuff is really consistent, I think that just kicks in like this autopilot in students' brains. Like they see that, that same font, that same template, and they're like, okay, I know who this is. I know what's going on. And it just sort of, um, you know, helps them to remember what's expected instead of having to spend so much time figuring out what it is you want from them. Exactly. And that's true in the day-to-day -day details. 
all of my exit tickets start with the same two or three questions. And then that's true in the really big picture details. We follow the same basic format for all of our writing assignments. They know they'll have a brainstorming activity of some kind. They know I'll expect them to turn in a rough draft with two questions attached. What do I like so far? And what, will that, what would I like feedback on? They know that we'll use the exact same editing and revising checklist with tweaks depending on what kind of genre we're writing in. And then they know that they'll turn in their, rough, their final draft. And that kind of consistency allows them to get used to the process and do their best work everywhere along the way. Now, let me ask you a question that I hear sometimes from teachers when I talk about using templates, reusing the same thing, not reinventing the wheel. Sometimes they'll say, I would get bored as an educator if I'm doing things the same way all the time and I'm not switching it up or, you know, all of my stuff looks the same or I'm just reusing the same stuff, then it, just, it sort of dampens my own enthusiasm for teaching. Like I have to do new things and be extra creative to keep myself interested. Have you ever encountered that? And if so, how do you make that work with the templates? I have encountered that. And that's honestly a really exciting place to be because that means that I have the mental bandwidth to create something really exciting. Mm. I think I reframe it a little bit because I always have the systems that I've created and that gives me room to play and expand. And so if I'm starting to get bored, that means it's time for me to find a new activity that I've never done before and see how that's going to work. Find a new discussion format to try. That gives me space to reconsider the readings I'm using or the other parts of the curriculum. For me, templates give me the day-to-day -day details so I'm not bogged down and let me zoom out more effectively to be creative on a larger scale. Yes, Marguerite, I agree 100%. Like I think about routines and structures and templates and things like that as as like a framework, right? And sometimes like I will picture an actual frame and the frame is sort of the boundaries for the art, for the picture, for the photograph or whatever's in the middle. It sort of ties it all together and it sets limits for um, what needs to be done. Because sometimes if, when you're planning a lesson, if every possibility is open to you, then that can get really overwhelming. So when I think about these structures as a framework, that means there's this empty blank can canvas inside that can be filled with anything. It, it, it really does free you up to be more creative in the types of activities that you plug into these structures. And I think it makes it easier for kids to follow along too, because they know that framework, they know the template and they're familiar with the structure of it. And then you can change up the content or um, switch up the activities a little bit. And I, I found the exact same thing, that it helps me be more creative than if I'm not working from these structures and feeling like every single lesson, I'm just trying to start from scratch and find something new and engaging for kids. Exactly. And I think at the same time, there are, there's depth to these structures that we don't always get to explore. Once students know how to have a certain kind of discussion really effectively, there are so many ways we can mix it up or extend that that we don't normally get to see until we've done the same thing a mm -hmm. number of times. Great. That's such a good reminder that, you know, student engagement and getting kids excited about learning does not necessarily mean coming up with something brand new that they've never seen before every single day, that there's so many ways to do it within familiar structures. And often that's better for them. Tell us about your templates for student feedback and the comment banks. This is the other place that I've seen the idea of comment banks before, and every time I've seen it in the past, I've thought to myself, oh yes, I'll do that next year, or oh yeah, that sounds like a great <laughs> summer project, which means I am never going to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am never going to have the time to sit down and write out a full comment bank. Now, I teach language arts, so I do a lot of long form feedback to student work, a lot of individual comments, a lot of here's what's really great, here's what you can improve, and a lot of revision work with students on their writing. So at a certain point, I realized that I was rewriting the same basic ideas over and over. And I mm -hmm. thought, maybe I could make a template for this. This year that's gone week by week. So each time I have a major writing assignment, I have a new template. I think next year I'll have one template for the entire unit or the entire semester. We'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. But essentially, this is another place where I don't make more work for myself. I start grading. And when I start writing a response that I think, oh, I will definitely need to write about this concept again, I slow down. 
I take my time. I craft a really helpful, effective response that one time. So I make sure that it's clear. If I have extra resources, I make sure I include them. So I might have a link to a mini lesson or the place they can look for more practice or more information. And then I send it to that student. And then I copy and paste it into that template, which is usually something like grading comments, essay. And then I keep grading. When I get to another student who deserves the same feedback, that's when I'll go and find the original piece of feedback and copy and paste it in. Now, Some students end up getting several copied pieces of feedback, and this includes both positive and negative feedback. You can use feedback about, wow, that was really effective. I really like the strong sensory details you used, like in your first line and then a specific phrase. You can copy and paste that and just change the specific example you give. You can copy and paste the, oh, look, please review the resources on MLA formatting. Here's the link you'll need into another student's essay, just the same. And this is where I really leverage search functions within my document. Control Mm. F searches on a PC, Command F searches on a Mac. So if I know I need the comment about putting dialogue into paragraphs when you have a new speaker, I'll search dialogue or I'll search paragraphs. And that will give me the quote I need. So is the document well organized or are you using just the search function? I usually have a header for the specific assignment. So I'll say I have a heading for expository essay. That's the one we just did. And put all of my comments there. I think a way I could expand on this next year is starting to reorder it and having a thesis section or a details section. But... Right now, I really do just lean on the search feature because there are so many different details that I could be looking for, and I don't really know until I'm there exactly what I am looking for. Yeah, I I feel like this is something that a person would have to discover by trial and error. Some people may want to have a super organized document with lots of different headings, and they can just skip to the headings. Someone else may say, you know what, if I have to organize these into headings, I'm not going to do the template. I already know myself. Like, I'm too tired. I'm too busy. I'm not doing it. I'm just going to throw it anywhere in the doc and I'll use the search function. And I think that's absolutely fine. Any template to me is better than no template. And I love that you point out that this is a multi-year project. This is not about having the perfect template that you use forever and ever. It's a working document. Every time you grade, you might be adding, you know, something to it. And, you know, as every single, certainly every single month, you're going to be adding more and more. And then, like you said, maybe next year, then you will uh, organize it a little bit more or add something new to it and really thinking of it as something that you're using to help you record the best of what you've been writing and not have to keep doing it over and over again. The idea of recording the best of what you've already done rather than trying to create the best thing you've ever created every day is a really helpful idea. (laughs) Yes. Yes, that's so well said. You know, I have I have two products in my Teachers Pay Teacher store. One is report card comments. Yeah. It's a system for making it um, easier to go through and, and start off with something positive about the student, talk about their strengths and so on. It's like a whole system. And then I also have one that's feedback comments for student writing. And every now and then when I share it, someone will say, I can't believe something like this exists. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. Like the idea of copying and pasting the same comments for multiple students, like every student deserves their own original feedback. Every parent deserve to see something, you know, about their child on the report card. And I think what you're hitting on here is, is, is the really crucial piece. This is not saying we're doing the same thing for everyone. We're just copying and pasting blindly and just giving them random feedback. You can still personalize from a template for sure, but you're not having to write everything out um, from scratch. And, you know, you mentioned earlier about how, when you, when you start to write something that you haven't written before and you realize, okay, I'm probably going to need this again, or this is good. And I want to use it again. You slow down. And you really, you think about your word choice and you read it over to yourself and you make sure it's exactly right. And then it goes into the template because that's the most exhausting part for most people for giving written feedback, for writing comments on things is trying to figure out how to word it appropriately, particularly when you're giving, um, you know, critique on student work. You don't want to just, you know, 
if you're not careful with your words, you can really like hurt the student's feelings and cause them to shut down. It matters how you word things. And you don't want to have to be doing that every single night or every single time that you're sitting down to grade, trying to get yourself in this headspace where you can communicate well. If you're already in that headspace and you figured out how to say it one time, that's all you have to do. Come up with one that one really well-worded comment about the sensory details in a paragraph, as you said. Write that out, and then you can just tweak that. Use a variation of that every single time after that. So I feel like when you have these kinds of templates, it gives you um, higher quality comments and feedback because you're copying and pasting from the best of what you've done. Do you find that that's true for you? Absolutely. I find that it gives me space to personalize for students and really think about what they need rather than trying to focus so hard as you said, on how to say things appropriately or clearly, Mm -hmm. that I'm missing the chance to say things in a way that will really connect with this student at this time. And so I think that using the templates as a place to start is really the key. Yes. And, you know, it also reminds me of what we were talking about earlier with the student activities. Having something brand new every single day is not necessarily the ideal. And it's the same thing here. Most of the time, what people are looking for is not like, oh, I've never seen this comment before. This this is a brand new original sentence that this teacher has never come, <laughs> never come up with before. You know, this thing that they said about my child has never been said about any child in the history of any child. You know, or this, this piece of feedback on this paragraph has never been given to any writer ever. That's not the goal. We're looking for clear and accurate and, um, you know, written in a way that is that the person can receive it well. And that's really the ultimate goal. And so I, I just love what you're saying about using this as the starting place for personalizing and choosing your very best wording and your, you know, your clearest communication, and then sort of tweaking from there to make it fit the individual in the situation instead of feeling like somehow some people have it in their minds, this is like cheating, that you're supposed to be starting from scratch every time. And to me, that just really feels like working harder instead of working smarter. They're not seeing the repetition the same way that I am as the teacher. And so that helps me take a step back a little bit and realize that the details that I'm focusing on are a place where I'm losing the forest for the trees, really. Mm -hmm. Marguerite, this is so helpful. I think you have really clarified a good process here. And I want to direct people to truthforteachers.com so they can see your article because you have screenshots of your templates in here. You talk about how much time you save with each one. You list out the steps. So if someone has been listening to this and thinking, this sounds really good, but I want to have like a succinct summary of it, it's all listed in your article. And you talked about how the student accommodations template saves you around three hours a week. The templates for instructional materials and activity saves you around three hours a week. And the template for comment banks for student feedback saves you about an hour and a half a week. You have talked about how you learned a lot of these techniques from the 40-hour teacher work week and how to batch and save time and everything. How How have you been working this into your work life balance and finding a schedule that's sustainable for you? I have reduced my workload from somewhere between 50 and 53 hours a week to just under 40. I'm working my contract hours and actually taking lunch and going for walks and having downtime over the course of the day where I can just take a moment and breathe. And that is huge. Mm -hmm. I will say that there have been some job changes for me in that. I've moved from a more traditional brick and mortar classroom to teaching online permanently, which has been excellent for me and for the students in the population I work with. And I really think that using my planning time appropriately to focus on what's important rather than focusing on what's right in front of me has Mm -hmm. been a key shift in being able to step away from the computer or the classroom when I need to. Mm Mm-hmm. I want to close out the show with a takeaway truth. What is something that you wish every teacher understood about saving time with templates? I think the takeaway truth is even bigger than that. It's not specifically about templates. I think it's that often we focus on saving time right now, but sometimes it's even more helpful to focus on how we can save ourselves time in the future without creating more work for ourselves now.